there. Okay, thank you, Sharon. And um, I'm going to bring this out. Um, yeah, and thank you for that introduction, Sharon. And it just reminded me, um, you know, the Yom Kippur War in Israel was a very uh, devastating time. And um, it's just extraordinary that, uh, you, that that whole theme of atonement just came so much to the fore at that time. And I think every time Yom Kippur comes around, we're all a little bit tense. Could that ever happen again? Um, mm -hmm. So thank the Lord, we passed Yom Kippur is over for another year. Uh, but um, it is, so Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement is the culminating point of the 10 days of awe that we talked about last week. And the Bible describes it as the Sabbath of Sabbaths, Shabbat Shabbaton. And we can understand Yom Kippur is like the Holy of Holies of Jewish time. It's the most solemn day of their year. And on it is played out the great drama of reckoning, accountability, making amends, and ultimately the hope of experiencing forgiveness and reconciliation. Now, it is described in Leviticus as a day to afflict the soul. So what does that mean? Well, it's usually understood that the people of Israel should lay aside all their usual activities and work, and they should fast and pray. And in Israel itself, all local radio, television broadcasts, all fall silent. Public transport is halted, people don't get in their cars, and Israeli airspace is closed to all flights. Um, and if you've been in Israel for Yom Kippur, it is an amazing thing to see uh, the streets silent and just full of people walking, families together, on their way to synagogue, enjoying the day. Uh, but I did listen to the news tonight and something very sad in Israel uh, in this past Yom Kippur, a 12 year old boy was hit by a car and died. Um, so that was something very, very tragic. And um, all the paramedics are out in full force on this day. Uh, because of the possibility of accidents. Um, I also heard that on a brighter note, eight babies were delivered today. So <laughs> that was good. Okay, so most people though, are going to be crowding into the synagogues. And over the centuries, Yom Kippur has evolved into a full day of communal worship services. And that's characterized by an emphasis on these two major themes, and they are repentance, teshuvah, and forgiveness. It's customary to wear white on the holiday, and that symbolizes purity. And it calls to mind the promise in Isaiah that our sins will be made whiter than snow. Some people wear akitel, that's the white robe in which the dead are buried, that is, it's a shroud. And according to tradition, this is the day on which God seals his heavenly books. The judgment he has made concerning the, your fate for the coming year is now settled. And so this day is essentially one's moment of last appeal, the last chance for the Jewish people to demonstrate repentance and hopefully be sealed for a good year. The ordinances for Yom Kippur were instituted in Leviticus 16. And here God introduces Aaron, the high priest, to the central ritual in which he is to officiate. His solemn task is to symbolically cleanse both himself and his people, as well as the sanctuary itself of all the iniquities that somehow have been accumulating throughout the past year. And these are sins for which the regular daily sacrifices were insufficient to atone. So this purification takes place through a ritual involving two goats. I'm sure you all know about it. One is designated to be sacrificed and its blood is taken to the inner sanctuary of the tabernacle the Holy of Holies, 
and apply it to the mercy seat. The other goat is to be released into the wilderness after the high priest has laid his hands upon it, symbolically transferring all the guilt of Israel on to the animal. And as the goat makes its way into the desert, the people are given a visual reminder of God's promise. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. And uh, <laughs> this picture that I've got for you here uh, is a picture by William Holman Hunt. You might know an English artist who's very famous. He uh, did that painting called The Light of the World, which is probably his best known. And uh, so he really wanted to paint this scapegoat. So he went off to Israel in the 1800s and he purchased a very rare white goat and he took it down to the Dead Sea area and he tethered this goat to a, a stake and, <laughs> and he proceeded to paint the, this poor creature and he had a rifle in one hand to fend off marauding Bedouin and uh, his paintbrush in the other. And um, unfortunately, the goat was a little bit fidgety, according to Holman Hunt, and eventually perished. But nothing daunted, he went back to Jerusalem and completed his painting. And it was eventually shown at the Royal Academy in London, where I think we can best describe reactions as very mixed. But there it is, the, the scapegoat, laden with the sins of the nation. So what takes place during the synagogue services? Well, of course, we don't have the temple anymore. So th this is something um, that the Jewish people have evolved to, um, uh, as best they can, fulfill the requirements of the Day of Atonement. So what we have here is a collective remembering of this ancient Israelite ritual of release. And liturgical prayer is standing in for the centralized priestly ceremonies. So if we have a look here, there's the order Ma'ariv. That's the evening service that starts on the, at sundown, the beginning of Yom Kippur. And then we have another six services that take place during the day, ending with Niyala, which is like closing of the gates. And so the really, um, you know, a lot of people will spend literally all day in the synagogue, uh, not without eating and without drinking anything. So it's a very intense day. In fact, um, Jonathan Sachs, who was the, um, Lord, uh, the um, chief uh, rabbi of the United Kingdom, uh, this is what he says about it. One can almost touch the divine presence so intense is the atmosphere of the day. So, Kol Nidre. At Ma'ari, the evening service, the opening prayer is a prayer called Kol Nidre, which literally means all vows. And that is recited at sundown. And it's probably the best known prayer in the liturgy. And it's sung in the traditional musical setting. And it's said that this is the one time the Jews who may not have attended synagogue all year, make sure they're in the pews on time. So they don't miss hearing this very powerful melody. And as the cantor sings the words, the haunting music, according once again to uh, Lord Sachs, unlocks the Jewish heart as no other. So Kol Nidre, has been sung and recorded by many artists over the past century. But perhaps the most memorable rendition is that here he is, Al Jolson, in the 1927 movie, The Jazz Singer. And that was actually the first Hollywood movie with sound. It was the first talkie. And it tells the story of the cantor's son, who chooses the stage instead of the bima but eventually puts on his talit and sings Kol Nidre. Now at the time, the idea of hearing the sacred words coming from a screen, it was unthinkable. 
Um, so it's clearly ushering in a very new era. And I find it really fascinating to think that the first talkie featured this Jewish prayer. Once again, the Jewish people are out ahead of us. So um, I think it has a special significance and I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that as well. But the music is sublime, but what about the words for Kol Nidre? The music is beautiful, but the words are prosaic. In fact, it isn't really a prayer at all, but a statement that would not be out of place in a legal office. Kol Nidre means all vows, and it's a formula that deals with vows, promise, all sorts of verbal commitments that we commonly make in the course of the year. And what it does is nullify the binding nature of such promises in advance. Here's the statement here. All valid, absolved, omitted, cancelled, declared, null, not in, okay, so it's very, very complete. Now, <laughs> Jews have been the subject of target of um, criticisms. Oh, you know, Jews don't keep their vows. This is why they have no, that isn't. It is because Jews take their vows so seriously that we have this. And um, also we have the fact, uh, we know the origin or how the, this prayer or formula really acquired so much moral power. We don't know when it was first composed, but it gained its strength during the Middle Ages when Jews were often faced with the choice, convert or die. And there were some under this pressure who did convert. They were known as conversos. And it happened in Spain and Portugal in the 15th century, but it happened in many other times and places. And yet many remained Jews in secret. They kept what um, part of their liturgy they could. And once a year, on this holiest of nights, they would come to the synagogue and tearfully entreat God, asking to be held innocent of vows they had made under threat of death. So we know that it is a very solemn and moving introduction uh, as we imaginatively cast our minds back over the centuries to the Jews that have uttered these words in so many um, different situations of trial and um, persecution. And I feel that if you have ever broken a solemn vow, I think we all know how heartbreaking that is. And um, we can understand the uh, power of such a prayer. And we can thank God who does let us come to him with such a prayer. And I want to hear us a modern prayer uh, by a rabbi that's um, very contemporary, so I'd like us to look at it. Every day I break my vows to be the dutiful child, selfless parent, caring friend, responsible citizen of the world. No one sees, no one knows how often I take the easy way. On this day, this one day, I stand before you naked, without disguise, without embellishment, naked. I implore you, let me try again. Okay, so moving on to the next day, and we have here, I'm not going to read through all this, this is vidui. Now this is, a, that means confession, and um, it's a unique aspect of the liturgy. Uh, and in the, these prayers, I've just shown you the first part of it, um, the community, all the uh, worshippers, they recite an alphabet of different transgressions uh, which have been committed from A to Z, or of course from Aleph to Tav, the first and last letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And when reciting all these sins, it, they traditionally beat just gently on their breast or on their heart in this act of self remonstration Now, if we have a look just, um, they're asking for you duress, hard-heartedness, inadvertently, utterance of the lips, immorality, knowledge, deceit, speech. You can see that it, uh, they've 
this is just the first part. This is just Aleph. Okay, so they go through Aleph to Tav, and they literally try and list every possible sin that they can commit. Now, the, and when we go through it, I'm not going to go through it, but the, the vast majority of sins, which you can probably see, uh, they involve mistreatment of other people, most of them by offensive speech, um, scoffing, or slander, gossip, tail-bearing, swearing falsely, to name a few. And these all come into the category of sin known as la shon hara, which literally means the evil tongue. And that is considered a very serious sin in Judaism. In fact, the rabbis consider that sin, la shon hara, that was the cause for the destruction of the second temple. But there is one sin that is not enumerated. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. So let's go on to an R. We have the Musaf service and Piyutim. Can you remember that? It's like poetry for Piyutim. This is the liturgical poetry. So many liturgical hymns composed for this uh, season. And this is probably the best known one. And it's by Yehuda Halevi, who was the um, 12th century poet who lived in Muslim Spain. And it's called O Sleeper Awake. So we'll just, this is just the first two stanzas. So let's have a look at it and see how it might relate to the themes of Yom Kippur. O Sleeper, wake, arise, delusive follies shun. Keep from the ways of men and raise thine eyes to the exalted one. Hasten as haste the starry orbs of gold to serve the rock of old. O Sleeper, rise and call upon thy God. Behold the firmament his hands have wrought on high. See how his mighty arms uphold the tent of his ethereal sky and mark the host of stars that heaven reveals, his graven rings and seals. Tremble before his majesty and hope for his salvation still, lest when for thee the gates of fortune ope, False pride thy spirit fill, O sleeper, rise and call upon thy God. So what biblical book are you reminded by the title of the poem? Did you think of the story of Jonah? <laughs> uh, that's read, and the story of Jonah is actually read each year on Yom Kippur since early times. And you know, in the story of Jonah, how the stormy ocean waters were breaking upon the ship the prophet had embarked upon in his flight from God. And when he was sleeping in the lower deck of the ship, the captain came and woke him up with these words, why are you slumbering? Get up and call upon your God. And so that's the theme of the poem. And um, so uh, it, the poem is trying to position the reader in the same situation as the prophet Jonah. He was a sinner hiding from God, sleeping when he should have been praying. And so just as Jonah had the choice to repent or face disaster, so too the listener to the poem is called urged to wake up or else face an unfortunate judgment. So why, why is the story of Jonah particularly read at this time? So the rabbis have given several answers. First of all, it reminds us of God's infinite mercy. Okay, if, if God could forgive Nineveh, then of course God can forgive the Jewish people. And the people of Nineveh themselves are a paradigm of repentance, a model for the Jewish people as they struggle through the day. It serves to reinforce the idea that the entire world and all its natural forces are in God's hands. The, the wind, the plant, the sea, the great fish, they're all vehicles of his redemptive purposes. And God's providence extends to and also includes the Gentile nations. It's really remarkable that the book of Jonah is actually a missionary book. It's the only book of the Old Testament that talks about taking the message to uh, a nation outside Israel. And um, it, it is that it is read on the National Day of Repentance, I think is really an amazing thing. 
But there's another really wonderful thing about the book of Jonah that I'd like to bring out. Have, the word is this scripture. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. And this is really what one wonderful preacher calls is the gospel of the second chance. And it's revealing something so wonderful about our God that so many times we fail, we fall short, we have a calling on our lives. And um, we, we just, for our weakness, our inability, uh, we don't rise to that calling. But God comes to us and he once again graciously um, opens a way for us to fulfill that calling. And, there were, and it was not just Jonah, it was if we look in the Old Testament or the New Testament, we can think of Moses breaking the tablets of the law. We can think of Jacob fleeing from Esau. We can think of David um, and his great sin. We can turn to the New Testament. We can think of Peter and his failure. Um, John Mark, uh, a myriad of um, uh, personages in the, in the Old and New Testament, in the Gospels, um, and it's so wonderful that the uh, Bible does not shrink from showing the uh, shortcomings of the men and women that it is uh, portraying for us. Such an encouragement. And so what does this gospel of the second chance reveal? It re it's the expression of a great mercy. It's the confidence of a great love. A father who believes that his erring child is capable of worthier deeds, of rising higher than he has fallen and the creation of a new inspiration. Like Jonah had when he went to Nineveh and uh, <laughs> preached that gospel and the whole city repented in sackcloth and ashes. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> the centerpiece of the Musa service is Seder Ha Avodah. What does this mean? You might remember the word Seder from the Passover Seder. It just literally means order. And uh, so it's, and avodah is work. So it means the order of work. And it's the order of the work that the high priest does in the uh, temple on the Day of Atonement. And it, what it is, is a minute, detailed description and reenactment of the atonement procedure, which took place uh, in the second temple in Jerusalem. And the overwhelming pageantry of the ceremony becomes apparent. And as it recounts the high priest's preparation for the ritual. So his baths, he, he has to bathe many times. He has to change his garments many times. And a, a, a substitute has to be appointed in case there's an emergency. There are many sacrificial offerings. I believe he has to slaughter about 12 animals. And so it's a very physically demanding role. And the highlight of this service came as the high priest entered the Holy of Holies and presented the offering of sin and applied the blood. And according to the Talmud, um, once he was in there, he would pronounce God's actual name. And this is an utterance that is otherwise forbidden for any other at any time. And he would prolong the utterance. And that would allow the other priests and the people in the outer court, they would bow, they would prostrate themselves, and they would acknowledge God's supremacy, proclaiming the eternal worship of his glorious sovereign name. So the high priest would then emerge to declare God's acceptance of the people's prayers for atonement. Now there is a very, very beautiful song that describes this whole ritual. And I'm going to try and play it for you at the end <laughs> and try and have the words up for you uh, because it is such an, and it, the, the depiction of the high priest is something really, really wonderful. But um, just for the moment, we'll just continue because I'd like to, Think about what this means for us as Christians. And I have a question. As the people of Israel stood outside the temple and they silently watched their lone representative 
bearing the blood of expiation into the most holy place, what might they have been thinking? Did the scene waken within their hearts a desire and a hope that somehow, someday, the way into the holiest place might be opened for all, that someday they also might come to experience the very presence of their God as he dwelt between the cherubim and find communion with him made possible, which surpassed all their dreams. In the New Testament, the book of Hebrews takes Jesus' death on the cross as its main theme, and it, try, it demonstrates, he tries to demonstrate that all the elaborate rites of the Day of Atonement foreshadowed and found their fulfillment in one perfect sacrifice. Now, according to the book of Hebrews, there was a double imperfection in this rite of the Day of Atonement. For, um, first of all, it, it was in the officiating priest and in the victim's sacrifice. So the Levitical priests were themselves transgressors as evidenced by the sin offering which the high priest had first to offer for himself. And secondly, the victims, it was impossible that the blood of bulls and goats could effectively and permanently wash away the stain of human sin. And for that reason, the atonement had to be repeated annually. So its very shortcomings, therefore, the feast, therefore, functioned to point forward to a greater, more effectual atonement that was yet to be provided. So Jesus was the antitype, not only, okay, so let's just look here. Oh, yes, all the imperfections of the original Day of Atonement vanished away. Um, when this one perfect sacrifice was offered at Calvary. Only the blood of the incarnate Son of God could provide expiation for the sins of all the world. <laughs> all this accumulated mass, but the blood of the Son of God was efficacious for it all. And this single offering affected for all time the reconciliation between the infinite perfection of God and the imperfect humanity, Jesus came to redeem. And Jesus earned his people not only forgiveness of sin, but the further assurance. Remember the goat in the wilderness. Their sins had been carried away for all time to the land of forgetfulness. And I think that picture of the goat disappearing into the wilderness evokes for us a consciousness of the desolation that Jesus experienced and endured to bring this guarantee of freedom for uh, his people. So, but Jesus was the antitype, not only of the sin offering, but also of the high priest so in a number of ways. Aaron, on that day, put aside all his high priestly garments and wore a simple white garment. So, we can look, we can understand that Jesus put us, laid aside his heavenly glory when he, and he put on his garments, he veiled himself in the garments of flesh and blood in the humility at when he became a servant to uh, fulfill our, the task of our redemption. The breastplate of the high priest. And I like to think that when Jesus entered that holy place not made with hands, he was bearing on his, his breast the names of all of us, all of those that he loved. The labor and toil of the high priest on that day, it was so extreme. And the, the physical and spiritual and emotional duress must have been uh, absolutely extraordinary. But um, even so, for Jesus, this work of atonement was something, a stupendous labor um, that he had to complete alone. The upper room ministry, there was the agony in the garden. There was the trial and the scourging, the cross, with all the weight of those transgressions on his shoulders. But when this true high priest died on Calvary, the veil separating the holy place from the holy of holies was rent. 
and the way was now open for all to come to God and commune with him between the wings of the angels and experience that joy, fellowship with God, and to receive the heavenly benefits Jesus came to bestow. In John chapter 20, there is a very moving visual symbol of this sacrifice. Mary stood outside the tomb weeping. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had lain, one at the head and the other at the foot. You can see the, the angel here and there. And it's an image of the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant, where Jesus made atonement for all and fulfilled the sublime purpose of the feast of Yom Kippur. And we know that a wonderful day will come when the spirit of grace and supplication will be poured out on the people of Israel as a nation, and they will look on the one they have pierced and they will mourn. And that will be Israel's great national day of atonement, when not only will the people be pardoned, cleansed and reconciled, but the land itself will be purged from defilement. This then is how Jewish history ends, not in unbelief and apostasy, but in a glorious restoration to be followed by a national conversion, which will be as life from the dead to the whole world. So as I suggested here, and this is the prayer that is missing in the Vidui, but it will be offered. Now, in closing, <laughs> I would like to play this beautiful, beautiful song. It's about five minutes. And I'm going to click on the subtitles, and I hope that you all, uh, and it's about this whole ritual of the atonement and the high priest, what um, going into make this atonement for the people. So let's, let's, oh, we probably have some ads at the beginning, if you can bear that. Thank you. 